Welcome back to the Aviation RC New Podcast. You found us. My name is Joe. And I'm Matt. We're here to be with you along your journey and to share our experiences in RC Aviation. If you have any questions, thoughts, or want to share a flight story, hit us up at aviationrcnoob at gmail.com. Now, buckle in. Let's take off. And we're back. This is episode 12, Hinges and Other Bits and Pieces. Uh, Matthew, you kind of put this one together, so what are we talking about tonight? Oh, I just had a box of junk. I started rooting through it, and no, I, and I started realizing there's a lot of bits and pieces that we use when we put together a plane. Uh, there are, some of them are things that are commercially available, and especially in the foam and the, I'll call it the flight test building style arena, there's a ton of stuff because it's like, you know, planes on the cheap that are repurposed from other tasks to accomplish goals on the cheap. So we're going to go through a number of those. Uh, we're also going to talk about some of the commercially available things because some of them, uh, I mean, they're, it's worth the money sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's just worth the convenience. And, you know, as a hobbyist, you're going to have to, kind of figured that out but anyway we'll, we'll get into all that kind of stuff uh we'll talk about hinges and um we're going to talk about all the control apparatus from the servo back to the control surface and kind of focus on those parts and pieces as well as like landing gear parts and pieces but not the gear themselves that will probably be a whole separate animal because that's that's a ball of wax uh i think we're not ready for well, and I'm sure when we do get into landing gear that you're going to want to talk about the a little more in-depth the landing gear that you had uh, built and put on the HRC-7. Oh, my God. Yeah, I'm so proud of that landing gear. <laughs> <laughs> it looked nice. You know what? It uh, It's just one that I've been struggling with landing gear. That's probably why I said we're not ready. And maybe you're ready. I don't know, but I'm, I don't feel close to ready. I feel like every landing gear I've put on has always been on the verge of coming to pieces. Uh, they aren't sturdy. They aren't stable. They come off. They, they, they might do the trick, but they're not sturdy enough to, for me to rely on them. I think often, mm -hmm. uh, although I have a handful that work, right? Like the ones that, uh, we've used for the old fogey, um, and then this, the HR7, uh, HRC7, um, the one I put for, together for that was awesome because it clips right. in and it clips out. And that's part of what, no rubber bands, there's not extra parts and pieces. You literally have the plane, you have the gear, you just clip it in and it works and it's sturdy too. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited about that. I, I actually plan on modifying that and trying it other places. So, um, but it's, there's, that's a separate thing. Yeah, and your experience with landing gear is uh, better and more varied <laughs> than mine because I've had, no. I've worked on two pieces of landing gear. One was the yeah. first, which was nowhere oh. near in line. There were two different lengths, Joe. <laughs> but we've talked about it. It just it wasn't a have. good set of landing gear. <laughs> That's and, okay. Like you were just trying to like, hey, how do I keep the plane? From having the prop strike before it get off the ground, which all right. you needed for that plane was five feet. So mm -hmm. uh, understood. Um, I was thinking more of, I could probably tell you more about what not to use for landing gear than what to use so far. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> that's right. I forgot it was. So that, that landing gear went on the fogey, uh, but before that it was on the glider. And that mm -hmm. was the one that only need a, like, literally a foot and a half because of the headwind to get off the ground. But anyway, yeah, right. and the other, other than that was my father-in-law's landing gear, which we got right. Uh, at yeah. least it seemed to be, he's taxied it around the, the driveway just fine. Mm -hmm. But on that plane's maiden flight, um, which I've kind of covered before, but had wrecked it and it didn't. Part of that <laughs> was uh, uh. it, it ripped the, it, so the, the simple cub had a landing gear insert that slid up into the fuselage yep. and the landing gear wire. I guess I didn't glue it properly because it didn't have reinforcement. It just popped right through the paper. Uh, yep. And then the last time we went flying with it, 
Um, it was windy. We were going to be out on the grass, so we took the landing gear off completely and said we're just going to belly land it and be yes. gentle with it. Yeah, the Scout, uh, the FT Scout, has a similar type of landing gear, and I had to reinforce the Dickens out of that, and it still doesn't really hold up. About 50% of the flights, the landing gear will drop out of the bottom after right. it's taken off, <laughs> which isn't what you want. Uh, you'd like to land with it, too. Um, anyway, but, you know, again, that's one of those trials where you're like, this looked like a good idea. And then the, the reason why I think it was done that way is in the commercial models, they'll have a plastic insert into the plane, into a molded piece that specifically accepts it. The plastic is strong enough to accept and clip and strongly um, fasten that landing gear wire section into the fuse that way. Mm -hmm. But with foam board and without the very uh, hand and glove style fit, it, you just, there's too much slop and it's just not strong enough of a material, you know, solid foam <clears throat> with a plastic guarding insert is far stronger than a uh, foam board with some paper. It just okay. isn't going to hold up anyway. So, uh, but before we get too far down that, uh, that rabbit hole, um, and it's a fun one to go down, which we will be doing. Let's talk about uh, what we did in the hobby in the last couple of weeks here. Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and go first. Um, okay. Go ahead and get the the disappointment out of the way, and then we can end on the high note of yours. <laughs> um, I wouldn't call it a high note, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you and I haven't talked a whole lot over the past two no. weeks, specifically about the hobby. Uh, so I'm not sure what necessarily you've got going on. I've seen your notes, but I don't like you haven't told me a story. So I'm looking forward to hearing no. it. But uh, I know last time I was hoping to last episode, I was saying I was hoping to get out and fly again and maybe start building on something. And truth be told, nothing. Um, yeah. I, haven't, I haven't built anything. I haven't flown anything. Um, it's Ooh. just been, yeah, no, I'm just but... kidding. I'm just kidding, Joe. Hey, look, you know, it happens. You know what I mean? As it was, honestly, I'm, you know, we'll talk about what I, but it was, uh, I thought I'd have a lot more time than I did this week and last mm -hmm. week to get out and fly. I thought, I was like, oh, I'm going to have tons of time. And I did not have nearly enough. I, you know, so it just happens, man. That's called life. It, it's okay. I also know you're in the middle of a renovation. So yeah. And kind of starting to get back in on that in in earnest and yes this is the same renovation project i was talking about way back in episode four um, by the way if you can pay somebody to remove wallpaper from your wall and get your wall perfectly set up and ready to go it's probably better off if you can afford it uh i'll disagree with you on that just because <laughs> it can <laughs> be done process. yeah i just that wall had problems um that, that's, that's what all i mean that i've never to. met a wallpapered wall that didn't have problems <laughs> <laughs> that's all it seems like they're like oh this wall's terrible i know we'll wallpaper it let's mm -hmm. leave that for somebody 20 years from now to deal with and then you, right. you 20 years later start pulling it off going oh this is going to be great it'll just peel right off then you're like well, this is disintegrating my oh my god this is like a wavy mess what who did this wall <laughs> yeah or what do they use to glue this thing super glue jesus uh, um, i didn't oh it's a new space age polymer <laughs> it's good <laughs> it's called anyway. epoxy so um yeah i haven't flown anything and there's been a couple days where i was like oh man like i do have a little bit of time i could throw the plane in the back of the car and go um but the problem boils down to I went and picked up a bunch of flooring for the bedroom, uh, and it's been in the back of my car for a week and a half. I just haven't pulled it out. And when I say a bit of flooring, I'm talking I got the back seats laid forward, and there's 450 plus square foot of uh, laminate flooring in the back of my back of my Prius, and Ooh. it's I showed That's you a, a picture. Yeah, I showed you a picture. It's got, it's got the back of that car dropped about six inches. Oh, so man. It, 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 there's just no room for anything back there. So I got to get all that out. And then maybe yeah. when the when the wild hair hits me, I can go. So, Matt, what's been going on on your end? Uh, all right. So for me, I, I, when we had finished up um, flying the RV7 
and the vulture last uh, last time, um, I was thinking to myself, I'm like, is it the motor or is, you know, there was not a whole lot of prop sticking out outside of that cowl. So I went and I put a 10 by 45 prop or 10 by 47 slow fly prop, so fly prop uh, on the front of the HRC7. Um, and I, I went out eventually, and I say eventually because I had a trek in the first week of uh, these two weeks break that I thought I was going to totally do it. I had it in the back seat or in the trunk, and I had it in the trunk with all of my equipment. And um, apparently somewhere during that week-long trek, uh, the bag tipped over and rest up against the tail and the elevator. Oh, no. Yeah, so I had to spend like... You know, an afternoon doing my best to, I don't know, undo some of the warping that had happened from that and some of the damage. So a bunch of glue, a little bit of respraying and remounting some of the skin so that I could kind of move the foam back without creasing. Um, I put some reinforcement barbecue skewers back there because I, I knew we had enough room in the CG where the battery was and stuff like that. So... Uh, and eventually, and I also had the motor mount had come off because, oh, I did take it out. And then I almost immediately flipped over. It came off the ground and it almost immediately tanked into the ground. It was, it was a whole bad day on, on top of a bad day. Um, and the motor mount came off. So I'm like, shoot. So I had to glue that back on anyway, while I was there, I made sure everything else was set. Um, but that took probably about a week to get to. Um, and then, so I had a little bit of a chance the other day. And I went out to the flying field, and it was beautiful, no wind, uh, other than the mosquitoes were out in full force. Uh, it was beautiful. So we, we took off. It was a very scale takeoff, and it was, at full battery, it flew pretty much like the other prop did, the 9 by 6 prop. Right. That flew about the same. Um, and as the battery started to kind of come down, Again, probably to about three quarters to half level, it started to perform much like it did before. Um, in that it was it was one of those about halfway through, it wasn't gonna come off the ground in a takeoff. So, you know, it's just one of those darn. Um, and it was started to fly a little wonky. Um, and I think because of the way the bag and all the fixing of the empanage some of the skins on the top and bottom of the elevator started to peel back. Um, it was warm. There's a little, maybe there's moisture. It was just after it rained earlier that day. So all of those things could have been some factors, but either way, it, I mean, it's a simple fix, but I was like, all right, it's uh, it's time to, time to bring this one home. Um, and I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to make that uh, flight test power pod mod. Um, mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about power pods in a little bit. And I know that the new CPAC power pod has significantly more uh, power just all around than okay. the one that I have in there. So I think if I put that one in there and use the same slow fly prop, uh, I'm going to have a lot of fun. So I'm going to give that a go, see if it works. Um, you know, it'll be fun. Again, I still, look, the plane looks great, so I'm enjoying it. Uh, I just wish uh, I didn't... <laughs> It dropped my go box pretty much on the back of the plane. <laughs> I'm making a, a little bit of, I'm like, oh shoot, my plane is still back there. And so mm. I, you know, I've been zooming around town as if there was nothing back there. And sure as not, there there was. Oh, and anyway. zoom so, you do. <laughs> hey, 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 now. Uh, I told you, my Yaris has got pickup. <laughs> anyway, yeah, so I did that. Um, and I don't know what happened the other night. Uh, and by the other night, I think I mean last night at some awful hour of the night. Um, I was just kind of reading through things and we were kind of thinking about, you know, I have my mind on Halloween and I'm like, you know, what would be really cool is to uh, put together a plane for Halloween. And so I put together, uh, uh, I don't have, we'll have a link in the show notes. Uh, it, and again, you only have 16 days from the day we're looking at it. It's the 14th today. So you have like 16 days to build and fly and try to build a spooky Halloween plane. I was saying, by well, by Crook. Why don't you go back to the beginning of that? Cause you just went into that. What, what is 16 days from now <laughs> other than Halloween? Well, no, it's Halloween. So uh -huh. I just said, Hey, before Halloween, 
build and fly a plane that's spooky. You know, a Halloween themed plane. Okay. Um, I've seen some uh, holiday things, uh, some based around uh, you know, Christmas and Fourth of July and stuff like that. So I thought, you know, Halloween's one where it'd be fun to have. There are occasional like bats and ghosts and specters and things like that. Um, there's vampires, which is a bunch of things that are supposed to be scary that fly around. Um, <clears throat> so why not kind of get the community to pull together and see what we can, uh, come, uh, can come up with? The things that are um, that anybody could kind of pick up and easily put together, maybe. Um, but And especially if you could fly it in your front yard, so it's kind of maybe small, lightweight, so you don't have to worry about hurting anybody. Right. But if you have, like a, a lot of people have Halloween um, fun flies and things like that, they're perfect for that kind of thing. So I just want to see what the community could pull together, but I hadn't even given it one thought at all until like last night. I got this wild hair, so I started typing up this challenge. I don't know. If I get one person to jump in and see what they can do, I already have one guy who's thinking about doing some something with spiders. So we'll see how that turns out. Um, there's a couple different things, you know, and I, I put some metrics to it so that we can have a brag Brag, bragging rights winner, but uh, <laughs> the idea is to just kind of see what we can come up with and have fun with it. Um, little thing. So I ended up thinking, well, right now, what is the scariest thing? And I thought to myself, duh, COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Right? It's changed everybody. Everybody's scared of it. I mean, in some way, shape, or form, we all kind of are, right? Um, so I'm like, how would you make a COVID-19? So I'm putting together COVID-19. It's kind of like a uh, almost like a profile. If you've ever seen like the profile Angry, Angry Bird plane or think of like a nutball if you're a flight test fan, um, but you have the profile of the virus vertically on, okay. in the middle of a nutball instead of like the rudder in the back. So think of something like that. It's like prop and slot kind of deal. Um, I made it really small because I have a power up system I was thinking of using. I don't know if it's going to work. If I have to, I'll size it up for... Um, the flight test easy pack, which is kind of like if you've ever seen the Banggood C17, it's that same power system. And it's a, I think it's a little bit like a step better, but it's pretty much the same thing. You're using the brushless 820 can motors, and the, I think they're like two and a quarter inch props or something like that. They're really tiny. Oh, that's uh, super or, tiny. Actually, it might even be, yeah, or they're one and a half inch props in diameter. They're really tiny. So anyway, uh, it's enough to fly something very light, like we're talking 50 grams for the whole thing kind of set up flying around. So my thought is the cool part about that is if you bump it into somebody, you know, nobody's going to get hurt. And if somebody smashes on it, I don't know, you're out 20 bucks. Who cares? You know, mm -hmm. it, I mean, I would, I'd still care, but at the same point, I'm not going to cry. Um, it's about fun. Uh, and then, so, you know, uh, take a look on the flight test forums, look for 16 day, Halloween build challenge. If you want, just even just looking to see what's going on or throw your hat in the ring, um, get people to talk about it. I don't know. Or not. Just, uh, I know I'm going to have fun. So we'll see. Well, I've got a couple of ideas that I might be putting into that ring. So that might be something we're doing on the build night. Um, so I guess, uh, I guess, I mean, that's pretty much my flying stories and my build kind of table stories for the last couple of weeks. That brings me up to today. Um, okay. So at that point, we might as well talk about the build party, right? We're going to do our build party. Uh, we're going to move it. Uh, we're supposed to be setting it up. I think by the time you get this, we had set it up to be that night or something. Um, and it's just not going to work for Joe and I. I've got a Cub Scout camp out and a bunch of other obligations I have to do. And I know Joe's kind of got something similar. So we're going to push it back a week to the 23rd. That gives you a little bit more time to kind of Think about what you'd like to do or maybe set aside the time. That'll be Friday, 10, 23, uh, 2020, um, between 7 and 11 Eastern Standard Time. Um, we'll definitely be kicking it off. Um, we may not be able to stay for the whole thing. I probably will. Um, I, I think I have that whole night free. So uh, likely I'll be working on this challenge, honestly. Um, yeah. But uh, And then we'll also have another build night next month, uh, and that'll be the Hangar RC build night. On November 14th, 2020, that's also going to be 7 p.m. to 11 Eastern Standard Time. Um, and what we're suggesting is go over to 
uh, thehangerrc.com and use the discount code ARCN-BN1, all lowercase, and it'll give you 10% off his entire store. Um, and go over to uh, Hangar RC and see what you can do uh, if you need to. They've got um, PDFs for free that you can download and kind of build them like you do flight test stuff. Um, but uh, his his real advantage to the product he has there is the skins. Uh, he's got a lot of great uh, design skins. Go grab some, send them to your, you know, get them mailed to yourself if you want to do it on the cheap or buy kit. Uh, either way, we're gonna we're gonna put together some of some of his stuff on that night on November fourteenth. Uh, um, the ten percent off uh, ends on November thirtieth, twenty twenty. All right, so that I think that brings us to the listener comments and questions. All right, let's see. Uh, so on the Facebook community section, hold up, um, we had wait what? We there's a community section on the Facebook page. Yeah, <laughs> I was surprised as you. <laughs> <laughs> I was paging through. I'm like, hey, look, there's a ton of other tabs here. What's this one do? What's this one do? Community. We have a community here, and I clicked <laughs> on it. <laughs> And we had a handful of our listeners and our fans uh, of the page there had, had come on and they, uh, you know, gave us some feedback, which we've been asking for. And I, I truly appreciate it. Uh, mm -hmm. We had um, Wesley Allen had been listening to the the last couple episodes. And I guess we talked so much about the Spitfire that he went out and built one. And it looks awesome, too. Yeah, it does. Uh, it's orange and silver. Um, I hope it, it I'd love to hear how his is flying. Uh, I imagine it's flying just like ours. The thing is a great plane. So, mm -hmm. mm. um, and then we had another listener, uh, Tracy Glenn had given us a couple quick comments. Um, he, he said that he, he didn't really understand. He had two things. So he, he gave us an idea for one of the bits and we'll talk about that later, uh, that we're going to cover. Um, and then the other one was he had a question cause I guess he, he flies larger planes. He must, just by the way he made his comment. Um, and especially with the larger balsa planes, there's a lot of space in those. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was saying, he's like, you know, you guys are in different worlds. Like, I hear you guys talking about barbecue skewers and, like, <laughs> twist ties and a bunch of other stuff. He's like, what in the world? Like, I've never used those or even thought about that kind of stuff on, on my builds. And I know on the larger balsa builds, you've – you kind of have to have um, a more resilient, stronger product. Mm -hmm. um, and un unfortunately, kind of the, the the kitchen supply closet isn't really where you're going to pull all your supplies <laughs> for building your plane. Um, with with the light, you know, one pound, two pound planes that we're building with the, I'll call it the foam board style planes, um, you know, we can kind of afford a little bit more flexible selection right and that's part of what this episode's about honestly so i hope we're not pouring our poor balsa build friends um but that uh you know if you're building balsa we're sorry we hope you're enjoying the other stuff um and maybe you know something that we're doing um might translate to something that you do and i'd, I'd love to hear about it um and i know joe and i i've had one eyeball over in balsa uh, and I, I've got a couple of friends who keep egging me on to like, come on, man, build the balsa. It's better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know Joe's got a handful of sticks. Yeah. yeah. I got, I got a friend out there that's, uh, come on, man, make, make the conversion already. Come on, mm -hmm. you can do it. <laughs> anyway, no, but, uh, so he, he just wanted to understand. He's like, I don't understand what the deal is with you. You keep talking about these power packs. You just name letters. And like, I'm supposed to know what the heck that is. And I said, okay, well, you know, <clears throat> I, I want, I want to be clear. Like we're fans of flight test because it's where it bring, you know, it's where we started. <clears throat> it's where I got the, a lot of my, um, access to the hobby through. Um, and they've come up with, I thought a very, maybe not unique, but an ingenious way to make it easy for people to start and grow in this hobby. And what they created was a swappable power pack, which is basically a pod with your power system, which is your motor, your speed controller, um, and I'll call it a bin that you can put your receiver and a bunch of other parts that mm -hmm. are the pieces that you need to move from plane to plane 
and the inexpensive pieces you build into the plane, like the servos <clears throat> and the control rods and things like that, they stay in your plane. They're not going to be changing. Last thing you'd want to do is pull out a servo to put it in another plane to add a control rod and adjust every time you want to move your power system. Like that's terrible. So th they said, let's, let's build this power swappable system. And with that, they kind of came up with uh, almost like three levels of plane size that lend themselves to the material that they focused on when they designed it, which was Dollar Tree foam or basically six millimeter foam. What uh, they went with, they have a like a park flyer size, which is anywhere between 18 and 36 inch wingspan. And it's an APAC, which is an 1804-2285 kV motor, which is, um, I think a lot of them based off of the quadcopter motor sizes. Oftentimes, because what was being selected for the quadcopters were incredibly efficient. So, mm -hmm. and they were also becoming very popular and cheap and accessible. So at the time, those were the go-tos. Like if you had to select like a, a Park Series flyer for, I'll call it like the Turnigy brand for an airplane, you'd pay almost twice as much as you would for, I'll call it an equivalent motor. And it's not really equivalent, but an equivalent motor from a quadcopter would cost almost two thirds to half of that. Um, right. So they just they just went with that, right? Um, so there, the APAC system is that 1806, 2300 kV. And it uses a 12 amp ESC. It uses a five inch by three by uh, three by three or four and a half by three prop. So basically a three bladed prop, just like a quad. Or you can use a two by uh, a five inch two blade. So five inch by four and a half or so, uh, or even a six by three. Um, although I was usually stretching that system. Uh, then mm -hmm. they also have like the upgraded one, which is 2205. That is a very common quad motor. Most of the five inch quads, that's the base motor that you kind of pull from. So <clears throat> their F pack is a 2205, 2300 KV. Um, oh, and the, the A pack was a uh, hundred to like 130 Watts, kind of when you figure it out. So I know Balsa builders, if I recall right, they work in Watts. When they say, well, what kind of plane is that? They're like, oh, it's a 600 watt plane. You're like, oh, okay. And that's just like somehow that solves it. And for us who are coming from the other side of things, it's more like, well, how big of a prop do I need? Usually right. if it's the right size prop, the motor and system you have behind it is going to be enough to do the job to pull the plane you want, right? Like if you've designed your plane to work with a 10 inch prop, everything else kind of falls in line if your motor will work that. Well, as long as your so, motor will swing that 10 inch prop. Yep, exactly. So anyway, uh, so the F pack is, uh, the 2204 or 2205, 2300 KV. It uses a 20 amp ESC. Um, that is a six by three prop or a five by four, five by three. Again, much of the same kind of propeller system, but it runs at uh, much higher speeds. Um, and oftentimes those go up to four cells. So they go from two to four cell batteries. And so the range of wattage goes up. Uh, and theirs is kind of like 130 to 180 watts. So you've almost at the upper end doubled from the lower end of the other, the other pack. So that's your park flyers. Um, and then so when you kind of get in that medium range, which in our case is like the old fogey or some of the, we'll call it like 30 to 40 inch planes, um, that you'll see that'll be kind of park flyer, but they're almost too big for a park. Mm -hmm. You want to try to find a club um, that uses their older system used as used a 2822 Emax uh, 1400 KV uh, motor. It would run an eight by six prop and it would run on a two or three cell battery. So uh, use a, it usually suck about 20 amps or like 18 amps or so. And so the wattage is about 150 to about 225 watts. Um, and what's, now your, the, they've, hmm? what's your referencing there is the B pack build. That's right. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, that's the B pack. Um, so when you're looking at their planes and it says B pack, that's, that's what they're referring to. Um, they've since made um, an upgrade to like all their motor systems and essentially their upgrades have essentially just increased the range of the amount of voltage you can put through the system. 
and not fry anything out. So they've increased the amount of amperage the ACs can hold and the range of cells that, of the LiPo battery you can plug into those cell, that system. And with that, you, you end up actually increasing the amperages or, or the wattages for the whole system a lot. Um, so the newer system uses a 2213 935 kV brushless motor. It runs off of 25 amp ESC that can run three cell or four cell lipo. Um, uh, and that's a, again, that's two to 300 watts, I think is what I roughly found out. Um, that is, uh, we'll call it like the super efficient DJI quadcopter replacement motors. Um, so that tends to be what those are. Um, and let's see, the, and then the CPAC, um, what we commonly call CPAC is like a club flyer um, where the planes are big enough where you might have to take them apart to put them in your car and transport them, but they're small enough to be able to be easily transported by a car. You don't need a, a trailer or like a special SUV or anything. They, they still typically fit. Like I've got a Yaris and I think every plane I've built that's a CPAC plane still fits in my car. <laughs> Maybe by hook or by crook, but it still fits in there. Um, and I've got a small sedan. Um, so the C the CPAC was originally uh, an Emacs GT twenty two fifteen uh, slash oh nine, which I think is the number of windings, um, okay. and eleven eighty kV brushless motor. It ran off of a thirty amp ESC, and it was running a ten inch slow fly prop, and it was a two to three cell system uh and then i think when you calculate that out that's about 250 to 300 watts and then the newer systems their radials now uh is a 2218 uh it still uh, runs at 1180 kv so almost 1200 kv motor and it but it runs on a 35 amp esc now and it can run a 3 to 4 s lipo uh still running on the same size prop. And then, so I think when I calculated, you know, doing the difference in cells it can take uh, and the amount, the extra amperage it might be able to pull through, you end up increasing the wattage to 300 to 500 watts. So you can see that when they go from the old systems to the new systems, you're, you're almost looking at a hundred amp, or sorry, a hundred watt increase in power. And for some of those, that's almost like a 50% to 200%, you know, 150 to 200% of the original system. Right. So, so a lot of people are like, oh man, I love these. And of course, what, what's not to love uh, about a larger motor system <laughs> for your plane? I mean, come on. Well, I know I certainly enjoyed slapping that, uh, that CPAC radial on that Spitfire. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, it was night and day. Uh, the difference between the B pack motor that I have and the C pack that you let me borrow that day. Yeah, I'm sorry to ruin you like that. It's fine. I mean, my B pack <laughs> flew it. Yeah, it did. Um, I, I was uh, I was happy to see that too. I think I'll just blame the C pack radio you gave me as the reason that I crashed the Spitfire. Sure, we can. <laughs> <laughs> um. When we, uh, and I think I forgot to mention like the kind of the roughly the size of the plane that a CPAC rolls, um, okay. you're looking at, it's like a 36 inch to 60 inch. Ooh, what happened? Um, uh, you're looking at about 36 inch to 60 inch, depending on, you know, uh, what kind of, what kind of plane you're looking at. Oh, I know what it is. Um. And then I, I didn't mention it, but I mean, they have like a micro size for, from micro size quads, like 1104. So they've made like little 18 inch wings that have twin pack motors of these itty bitty motors, um, much like I was using on the Spruce Goose, something kind of that size where they're like itty bitty. They run like three inch props, um, six amp ESCs. Uh, I think the max is like a two cell, but they might actually run up to four cell. I know mine do. Um, so you're talking like a 42 to 82 watt system. You know <laughs> what I mean, so it's smaller, but I'll tell you what, those things cook. Uh, I mean, those are, those are the systems. So if we call out like an H pack, that's the micro quad, um, 
A and F is like the small park flyers. The C is like a club flyer. Um, and not quite as big as some of the balsa planes. I couldn't even begin to tell you what the CC equivalent is. Just, if you know, I can't even begin to help you. That Don't look at me. <laughs> oh, oh, darn. I was looking at Joe. He's like, nope. <laughs> I have no um, answers anyway, for you. No, I know, right? So I hope that that answers uh, your question, Glenn, uh, Tracy. And, you know, if not, I mean, all I can suggest is, you know, go to Flight Test's page and just see what they're doing over there. I'm sure, it, you know, maybe it's for you, maybe it's not. Um, uh, they definitely have all of their systems for sale, so you could look at the specs of the motors and, you know, maybe make heads or tails of it. Eh, maybe not. Um, but either way, I hope that that makes, shed some light on what we're talking about when we talk about it. Getting into the main topic, which I know you're going to uh, also bring Tracy back into that conversation, but hinges and other bits and pieces. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, we've talked a little bit about some of this uh, over the past couple of days getting ready for this, but what you got, Matthew? Oh, boy. Uh, well, I'm going to start off with what uh, Tracy Glenn gave us, and his was a um, an, an all-included uh, collection kit. Uh, basically, it's a trash bag, and he he flies the balsa, so they're big enough where you can you can stuff the whole bag right in there. And if you crash, don't you don't have to bring anything with you. Just go out, and if it's busted, you just pull the trash bag out of your plane and start <laughs> collecting. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, it's it's a plane recovery kit. Uh, so, and and I think what he's mentioning, especially with balsa, and it's the same goes for foam board, and um, especially for uh, most of the other kinds of foam planes, EPP. Um, I'm going to blank on every other kind of foam there is, but most of them, if you can find all the pieces, um, you should, you might, might could just put them all together. You should be able to glue them back together and through different techniques, kind of restore them to much of their original condition. Mm -hmm. Um, definitely to the point where you can fly them again, even, even some of them better than new because the joint sometimes is stronger now with the glue in it than it was when it was just foam itself. Um, or just balsa, just wood. I know oftentimes the wood joints are typically that way. Like the actual glue is stronger than the material that it's bonding to. Um, so anyway, uh, so that's, that's something, that's a little bit and piece uh, that you can have with you, honestly. Uh, carry a trash bag in your car or with your, with your put it in your go bag, right? Or, as Tracy says, stuff it down in the fuselage of a plane. Um, <laughs> and I can see, like, now that I've thought about it, I can see where that would be beneficial. Because, like, for us, we, uh, like, even when I crashed the Spitfire and it broke in half, like, it was still kind of hanging together. But even if it had completely yeah. gone in half, or if I was doing a, um, where the wing was rubber banded on, typically mm -hmm. we're picking it up in two pieces and then... You know, if the prop broke, you're picking those pieces up and shoving them in your pocket and picking a plane up and heading back. But uh, having seen some of the the balsa wrecks that the guys in the Discord server are sharing, um, I can see where having a bag of sorts would be beneficial because they've shown some pictures where those things just go to pieces. Yeah, it's it's like picking up matchsticks. Definitely. Um... Okay, so I guess one of the next bits and pieces, and I think I'm going to try to, um, I'm going to roll from one end of the control system, the the surface system, up all the way to the servo, okay. um, and then we'll we'll move from there to I think probably towards the gears. Um, uh, let's see. So uh, we're going to start with control horns. All uh, right, these are the things that you insert and adhere and bond to your control surface to allow you to um, motivate it around the hinge point, right? So move it around the hinge point. Um, and there's like professional stuff where you can get like Dubro. It's a molded plastic or a nylon piece that you, you know, push through the surface and clip onto the other side so it stays put and it's tight and it's not going to come off. But I think with a little bit of uh, finagling, you can kind of, you can loosen it with the right trick. 
and use it on a different plane if you've abandoned ship on the one that crashed into matchsticks. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, and they're they're good for foam. They make them for foam. They make them for uh, balsa. Uh, a lot of them can be used on either. Um, I know I've used gift cards. Um, I've used uh, balsa ply. Um, the the gift cards you kind of cut up into little triangles and drill a couple small holes in them, mm-hmm. and then you kind of scuff up where it's going to insert. I've also seen it where you actually have two tabs that butterfly out. And then that adheres to the bottom side or the other side of the of the control surface, and then the control triangle pops through the control surface uh, over to the hinge, okay, um, like over top of it. And then that's so that way it's actually pulling the entire surface and not just the top of it, not just the top surface of the um, control material, right? Right. <clears throat> um. Another one um, is 3D printed. And of course, those take the same shape as any professional looking thing. I've seen every shape and size and snap together, glue together, um, every arrangement you can think of. <clears throat> and really just do what seems to work for you. Um, you want enough surface so the arm doesn't pull out and enough surface for the glue to adhere to and bond with your control, uh, your control surface. You want to make sure that the two don't move, right? Right. Um, I've actually taken extra servo arms, especially on the micro builds, the really small ones, and clipped one of the extra servo arms in half and stuck that through at an angle. And then I basically use the extra knob where it normally sits over top of the servo. It's kind of a bulge. I use that to kind of anchor it on Mm -hmm. the bottom side of the paper. And then I hot glue it in place, and then I make sure it has plenty of time to cool. And then when that's done, that's usually strong enough. Um, and then I think one that I saw that I love, and I'm going to have Joe, I want you to talk about it because you know it well. Yeah, it's, it, when you showed it to me and you told me about it, I had to go out and get a pack myself. Is um, do, Was it Dollar Tree? I guess it was Dollar Tree. Uh, dental floss. So mm-hmm. these are the little floss hooks uh, with a little, Plast- well, it's all plastic. It's got the, the floss string between the U-shaped hook and then a pick on the other end. Uh, but in the handle of it, and I don't know if they do this to save material um, or why, but there's there's three holes along the handle of it that are pretty much the perfect size for the landscaping wire that we use when we're you know making our control arms or, sorry, mm-hmm. push rods. Um, and it's, it's worked out great. Uh, you, you take and you cut the end of the, the pick off. So, you know, cut it off a little beyond the the third hole in the handle. And then you cut the floss section out, but you cut that at say a 45 degree angle. So you got sharp little bits in that U shape. You can push into the foam, uh, and then you glue that down and position it correctly. So, you know, your, your pivot point with the with the push rod is over the hinge point but it does a, it does a great job uh my spitfire had them um i'm thinking no my old fogey didn't have them cuz i was i had salvaged the balsa uh control horns from mm-hmm. my glider from way back but um i have used them they're good the only the only thing to watch out for them is I had gotten to a point I had gotten where I needed to take them loose or move them or something had happened and I was trying to re-glue them into a spot that had already been glued into so I was trying to remelt old glue and apply <laughs> more glue and yeah, uh, yeah. the heat of the hot glue will soften that plastic. Uh, yeah, and make yeah. make it where it can it'll bend it'll move it it won't sit you think you're right and then you'll you know yeah. as your as your hot glue's cooling like you will look a minute later because you're holding it you look away to look you know go look at something else for a minute while it's cooling you look back and you thought you had it right the whole time but now the front end's sagging it so just be mindful how much hot glue <laughs> you're using with those but you know they yeah, they do a really good job and once they're on and the the glue's cooled. They, it's not going anywhere unless you really grab it and yank on it. Yeah, and it and if you're still a little bit concerned, and this kind of goes with a lot of the 
arms we mentioned, uh, especially the kind of, I'll call it the ad hoc arms, um, take a little bit of like 200 grit sandpaper and just run it along the spots that you're going to put into the control arm material mm -hmm. or the control surface material. And then that's going to really catch on to whatever you're gluing it with. Uh, that'll give it extra bite into the um, adhesive. I'm going to have to incorporate that into when I use them because I've just been taking them straight, clipping, and sticking them in. Yeah, I, I started using that because I was using gift cards, uh, extra gift cards um, that I had lying around or old uh, credit cards that I you know, didn't need anymore because they expired. So I, I clipped them up and uh, I would scuff the surface because that helped it adhere because those are pretty smooth and they'll pull out if you're not careful. Mm -hmm. um, all right, I guess that brings us to uh, the next piece, which is the end treatment of the control rod. Um, so there are a couple different ways. Right? You can Z-bend it, which is basically just kind of a, put a crink in the end of your wire and stick that through one of the holes in the control arm, and then you have uh, a flexible but, but straight way to move your control surface. Uh, you yeah. could also use uh, linkage stoppers. Um, they basically screw into your control horn and have a hole that runs in the seam that's parallel to your control rod, and they have a set screw to basically pinch it in place. And if you're having a hard spot, uh, you were telling me about an idea to keep that in place, because I sometimes have that where I, I've tightened it down as much as I think I could, and it still shifts just slightly. Yeah, so I've heard, and I haven't done it myself, but if you're experiencing or worried about that wire moving within the linkage uh stopper then you can just go in with a piece of sandpaper or a file just kind of get yourself a flat spot um mm -hmm. there where the set screws want to go against and kind of go a little bit to either side so you got some room to adjust but that gives it yep. a flat spot for that set screw to bite in makes, and yeah that makes perfect sense yeah, and full disclosure on that i i think i heard that from uh rod and tom talking on the RC plane yep. lab. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's uh, that would definitely work. Um, and then, of course, the set screw. Uh, I've seen two basic kinds. I've seen the hex type and the Phillips head set screws. Uh, I, I don't like to have the hex heads because I also don't like to have the hex screws with me because if I do, I'll likely do something stupid with the motor if it mm -hmm. starts to come loose. So I, uh, because I opted to not do that, I tend to keep the Phillips head with me because I always have the Phillips head screwdriver with me. It's good for other things. Um, so I always have one with me. Uh, so I, I have the Phillips head set screws. Um, it's a mixed bag. They're not as strong. Uh, they tend to strip a little bit easier. Uh, I've also seen the ends are uh, as a clevis. And so basically a clevis is essentially a Y where the Y has little pinchers between the top of the two arms and they pinch and go into the hole in your control arm, and then you you move up like a, a rubber ring, almost about the size of like um, aquarium tubing, maybe, and you kind of roll it up, and that keeps the, the top ends of the Y pinched together, and then that, that keeps it into the, the control arm. Um, I've seen that on some professional kits, uh, and they typically screw into the end of your control rod. So the control rod typically is threaded and the clevis has a receiving end. And then, so that mm -hmm. way you can micro adjust the length. And if, if you're having trouble picturing that, like I did, um, cause I, for a long time I was trying to figure out what is this clevis thing they're talking about, but go and Google it. Like as soon as you Google it, you'll, you can, Oh, yeah. Right. It's okay. Dirty. <laughs> no, it's nothing bad. But you know, once once we were uh, looking up some of these other names that I I was looking, I said, "Oh, that's what a clevis is." Okay, because mm -hmm. I heard it talked about, but I wasn't really grasping what it was doing. Right, I hear you. Um, another thing that I've seen, I haven't had a chance to do yet, but it is on my list of fun things to try. Um, next time I see an opportunity, um, is to basically have you have your your control rod go straight and it actually travels past your control arm. Um, but you have a hook that, that basically you 
heat shrink tube to the control arm and it and you basically it almost like crab claws around the push arm and so that hook goes through the hole in the control arm and the control rod keeps it in place the heat shrink pinches it together much like the the tubing that i talked about with the clevis but it's heat shrink tubing and then to set it so it doesn't shift up and down the control rod that's straight you use just a dab of ca glue and as i understand it that works like magic the other option for that instead of heat shrink tube is what i've been told works really well too uh is using threading and you basically lash you know 10 or so times around um and then kind of tie it down and then you just do a a dab of ca will um wrap it'll basically solidify that threading and keep that whole mechanism tight but it allows a little bit of flex so you could actually pull it off and take it off of your control arm yeah when you try that out let me know how that works out for you that yeah i I wish i had pictures of it because there's um there's a couple guys on that to do some slope soaring and that's one of the ways to keep things really light because you're not adding a whole mechanism you're just like it's an extra wire with a little bit of heat shrink tube and it, it does the trick so and i think um uh i think that's it for the end treatments. Let's see. I think we can talk about um, push rods at this point. Um, push rods. We have, wh- let's see, what can we use? Okay, so I you can use music wire. That's the traditional professional, um, professional thing to do um, it comes in every possible diameter you can think of pretty much it's springy it's a steel spring wire um, so it's resilient um, and it's steel so it's very strong for its weight um, so those are the go-to the problem that i've found with it is that it's it's awful expensive um, yeah you get maybe six feet for eight bucks uh, at a buck a foot i have a hard time with it when i can go down to Lowe's. Or and I can go and pick up a bundle of landscaping wires with so those little flags on it, and it's I think it's 13 gauge steel or close to it. it might be a little bit thinner, maybe 16 or 22 gauge steel. Um, but it's springy, um, it's strong, it's stiff, and it comes eight dollars to the bundle or nine bucks to the bundle or something like that. So you're paying a tenth of the price. Yeah, and you get a lot of it. A lot of it, and you can you can find lengths up to I think about twenty two inches, twenty three, almost two feet. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's those, uh, and I saw a comment when I was looking at some. I think I was looking at the uh, looking for the link to like the dental floss trick that we talked about because I wanted other people to be able to see what we're talking about. Same with some other hinge ideas that we we're going to talk about later. Um, so they, they talked about using, um, batting insulation, batting wire. So, um, in some houses you put the batting up in between the joists and the joists are typically I beams or like, um, I small, small trusses. Mm -hmm. And to keep the batting up in the, the trusses, you put wire across the gap. And those joists can typically run anywhere between you know, 16 inch on center or about 24 inches on center. So they've got wire that's 23.5 inches. It's 13 gauge spring steel wire, and it comes in a bundle of 100. It's a little bit more expensive, um, but I haven't and I haven't been able to take a look at it see if it's much different than landscaping wire. Um, I think it might be thicker. Uh, so that might actually, uh, one of the people were, was making a comment that they oftentimes use it for landscaping, uh, for landing gear wire too. So it mm. might be a little bit stiffer. Uh, that's another thing that you can do. Uh, I have also, when you're starting to look at uh, weight as an issue, you can use barbecue skewers as your go-between because, I mean, steel is relatively heavy for its unit weight. Uh, wood is often, especially bamboo is known for its strength for for uh for weight ratio um so you can use a barbecue skewer and then basically you just do the end fittings as uh steel so you you basically bend your end treatment 
as a small segment, maybe a couple inches, and you either lash it to the end of the barbecue skewer or use the heat shrink trick that we talked about, and you you put a dab of CA glue, and almost okay. all the weight in the CA goes away when it dries. Um, so you're looking at a very lightweight fixture that's, you know, um, what is, I think they come in about 18 inches. I mean, they come longer, but um, a, a much it, lighter weight. Is it really that much of a weight savings? Uh, yes, especially when you're looking at a very tail weight sensitive craft. What I realize is that when you put a 24 inch steel wire in there, you might as well take that nine gram servo and just put it right in the back of the tail. It's almost exactly the same moment wise. So if you can then take that, that length of wire and put it to something that's much lighter, and we'll get into another option because probably people are yelling at, what are you doing? Carbon fiber. Like, um, <laughs> but maybe you're like me and I, I don't have a bunch of carbon fiber hanging around in the corner. Um, so barbecue skewers might be the alternative that you, you have access to. Okay. Um, but that said, carbon fiber is the, is a great alternative. If you can find it in different in diameters, uh, from one millimeter all the way up to got awful big because they use it to do all sorts of great things structurally. Um, uh, with that, well, you know, you can use a uh, metal, let's see, the aero shafts, I think are about six millimeters. They're easy to get to, they're abundant, they're cheap. Um, but when you're talking about push rods and stuff in planes, you're going to look at like, you know, two millimeter or one and a half millimeter rods. Um, and they're great. They're super lightweight. They're super strong. Um, and they, you can you can even they even some of them have center holes. They might be square, the carbon fiber, but there's holes through them, and you could they might you can get them the same diameter as the end treatment wire they're going to use. So you basically slide it in and just do a dab of CA, and you're good to go. Okay, now I don't have a whole lot of experience with carbon fiber, um, and you're talking about getting them as small as one millimeter. Mm -hmm. Is yeah, it your hobby stores will have that? Okay, does that carbon fiber being that thin have any sort of flex to it? Because a lot of times we're having to kind of... one millimeter, yes. Uh, when okay. you're talking about like two, two and a half millimeter, um, then you have a lot less of that. Um, but like at one millimeter, or half, I think I bought some that's half because uh, I was doing... I was trying to repair a piece of... I can't think of the name. It's like a super ultralight indoor flyer and it's just carbon fiber and mylar sheeting and it weighs i think a total of 30 grams or something like it's awful Ooh. crazy light yeah so the the landing gear wire is like eh, super thin um and yeah there's flex you literally take it home bent in a, a fairly large circle um, okay. but when you cut it to the nine inch length or eight inch length you're going to use there's almost no flex but when you you know if you use a good length of it you're going to get some so you treat it almost like a flexible rod where you you support it with a tube, you know, every you know six inches or something like that, and you'll you won't have a problem. Okay. Um, another option is to do the tube and cable. It's almost like uh, your bike brake wires, where there's a tube and you have a steel cable that's connected to each end. So when you pull the one end, it pulls the the other end that's not like fully supported by the tube, and then that's usually pretty flexible. But as long as you anchor the tube along the way, there's not going to be any flex. Um, and that's when I see a lot of balsa builders use. Um, I don't know a whole lot about it. I just know it's out there and it's a product that's commonly used in the hobby when you get to the builders, uh, the bigger stuff. Okay. I was going to ask what kind of, um, uh, servos you need pushing that. Cause in my experience mm -hmm. once like limited, but I remember my bicycle, like mm. that, or even, um, I was repairing my head's trimmer the other day, and it's got that that tube and wire that connects the throttle to the throttle trigger to the carburetor, and like it's not the hardest thing in the world to push through, but it's not no. like but for a servo, nothing. yeah, but for a nine gram servo, like eh, yeah, I don't I don't think that's gonna work. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I think they make it so that the tubes are just a hair bigger, so there's a lot more freedom of movement. Um, and I think they line them with like a, like a lithium, uh, what, what am I trying to think of the stuff that they put on, um, graphite, I could put like a okay. graphene or something there. You know, I don't, I don't know. Um, lithium grease, maybe I, I, I'm, I'm talking completely on my back end. So 
I, I really don't know. Um, I just know that it it is a product that's available. It is used for control surfaces. So look it up, uh, learn something about it. Maybe we'll we'll follow up when we start getting into the bigger builds if we ever do. Um, because that's definitely something I'm going to want to know more about when we get there. Yeah. Uh, and then the other thing is when you're looking for ultra lightweight, and we're talking, um, you're looking at a competition craft where you're trying to save every ounce you can to be as light as possible to stay up in the air for every second counts, you know, kind of deal. Um, a lot of guys will use the old method that was used in planes, which is the pull pull method. It's basically you just use a non-stretch line, oftentimes a fishing line that might maybe steel or a very thin steel. And then basically what you do is you set it up so it's running around pulleys and it pulls uh, when it's going one direction. And the other side of the servo, you know, use the T-shape arm and mm -hmm. you hook it up to each each hole. And then your control surface also has a control arm out both sides. and that you you know you anchor it on either side and then one side pulls from the one side of the servo and the other side of the control arm pulls from the other side of the servo arm. Like right. the other as end. it's as it's turning one way and pulling the other side of the control arm is given the slack to allow exactly. the movement. Yeah, that's the better way to put it. It's given the slack exactly. And so I mean it'll remain tense and then it won't like fall off your system, but it'll also be um, it's also incredibly lightweight in comparison to all these methods. I'm pretty sure it's, it's just significantly lighter than, oh, yeah. except for maybe the carbon fiber. I really haven't tested the difference. And yeah, maybe I'll get to that point when I'm doing a bunch of, you know, homemade, um, discus launch gliders and stuff. Those are an, an example of somewhere you want something as lightweight as possible. Cause you want as much time as you can to find the thermal so you can fly for longer. Mm -hmm. Otherwise your trip's about a minute. <laughs> you know <laughs> um okay so that's so we went from control arms and treatments push rods so that pretty much brings us down to um it that's pretty much the control system down to the servo right <clears throat> so i think that takes care of that segment so now the next question we had a little tip um uh, about a prop saver so if you don't have a prop saver i've seen two things so, I mean, if you have a prop saver, but you do not have the O-ring that fastens your propeller to that prop saver device, there's two things I've heard. Um, take balloons, the cheap dollar store balloons. So you get a pack of 100 for a buck or something, and you cut off those those ends. You usually put in your mouth and then you tie. Yep. Right. Cut those off and use like two or three of those and wrap your, uh, wrap your propeller to it. That okay. Way. Um, they're strong enough and thick enough where they should work. Um, you may have to use more than one, though. Uh, the other thing I've seen and I've heard um, is that you use a bread twist tie. Those little little tiny steel cables you keep your bread together. Right. Bread closed. Uh, you apparently wrap them around and then twist it. That. And it, it that, seems that like it wouldn't. Yeah, that, that one concerns me a little bit because it. It, it it seems like the whole idea is with a prop saver is to have the the give that comes with the rubber O rings, and right. like if you were to have a a prop impact or a bad landing where your prop was at you know perpendicular or similar angle to the ground, you know the the rubber O ring lets it come off or lets sure, it yeah. move in such a way that it's not going to break. It would mm -hmm. seem like the the bread tie would have more strength to it and thus kind of be the same as having a, a nut on the end of that that prop um okay i could see that i could see that um also keep in mind it's really thin gauge wire so it's only so strong um i, I was thinking that if you, and it may also be and this is where the the comment really didn't specify it may be that when you're tying that around you tie it in an x pattern so okay. the first goal of the o-ring is to resist the force of the thrust of the propeller, right? The motor is spinning the prop. The prop is going forward at a certain thrust. Mm -hmm. And if your O-ring is strong enough, it'll bring the motor with it. Right. Uh, right. It'll bring it with it. And 
that's that's the first job of the O-ring is to keep the prop attached to the motor, right? And bring the rest of the plane with it. So it has to be strong enough for that. And then the other half is that when a prop hits and all the weight of the plane is trying to torque the prop and break the propeller, mm -hmm. that the propeller can, it, it'll give enough where the propeller can rotate off of that mount. And if it's in the next pattern, I imagine it'll have the ability to do that. And those things aren't super strong. They're going to break. I guess um, in my mind, I'm accustomed to whenever I did, whenever I used the bread ties to tie up the bread, I always, you know, spun the bag, put the tie around <laughs> it, and I just went to town cranking on it to put a bunch of, t I got to put, you know, 10, 15 twists in there. Like, I, my bread's not coming undone. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I've seen that. I, I don't know how much that works. Uh, it's worth a try. Uh, I've got a couple of props here, so I'll give it a shot. Uh, and I'll report on it when I do. Um, and then I think that kind of brings us to what do you use for tires uh, on your landing gear and uh, the wheel hubs for those. Uh, that's kind of an area where you, you can buy the product, right? Like you can buy the foam wheels with the plastic um, mold printed hubs. They come right. preassembled. Their diameter is the exact same size. I think it's usually eighth inch diameter hub hole. Um, and that's typically what landing wire, uh, landing gear wire is. It's eighth inch steel wire. And you take it, you bend it with pliers. It's stiff enough to resist most stuff. Um, you know, but other than that, I mean, um, but I've also seen a lot of different versions of how to make tires and how to make hubs. Uh, what do you, what have you used, Joe? Do you do you remember? Have you tried the, anything yet? Yeah, the only thing I've had as far as landing gear goes is what came in that kit to begin with, which mm -hmm. was the you know, the plastic um, rim, if you will, uh, the yeah. inner of the tire within, like yeah. you know, the tire yeah. itself was sort of that rubber foamy, yep. um, you know, stuff on yeah, the yeah. outside. They're good stuff. I mean, those are good tires, they're, and they're lightweight, too. They're kind of thin, so they're pretty light. I I remember looking at them going, hmm, maybe I should get a pair of these. <laughs> I mean, they they were nice if you're, yeah. you know, landing gear wire straight. Uh, um, have you tried anything uh, homemade? No. Um, okay. Although I've seen, I've seen you do, say, multiple pieces of foam board slapped together, yep. um, cut into the circle, but... I'm kind of at a point right now where I'm just not comfortable with landing gear. I'd rather mm -hmm. I'd rather hand chuck it uh, and then bring it in for a nice soft belly land. Um, yep. Like, and some of it too is just I don't have a place I go fly that has a good takeoff and landing spot, so I would always yeah. be in the grass. Um, right. And it's just easier at this point for me to throttle up and. Let her rip. I, I guess I'm so glad that you've had far better experiences on the hand latches than I have. Because <laughs> I, sw <laughs> I swear every time I throw a hand latch, I'm like, this is going in the dirt. This is going to go in the dirt. And that's going to be it for today. And I, <laughs> it feels like 75% of the time I'm dead right. <laughs> so my quest for landing gear is um, probably almost close to a, a, an unhealthy level of desire. <laughs> to find gear that just works, which is probably why I was way too excited about what I came up with for the seven. <laughs> but it was, it was cool. And yes, you were yeah. excited. You were super stoked about that, but, um, <laughs> you know, it rightfully so. Like that was, that was a nice concept and the way it clipped it. I'd be curious to see, uh, see how you adapt that to other planes. Mm. Uh, but at least for that one, you know, just simple fact that you could clip it on, clip it off. Yeah. Yeah, you know, without too much trouble was um yeah, I, I was um I was definitely pretty um I, I was pretty surprised at how well that worked and I'm eager to see how it uh how it holds up. Mm -hmm. So um okay, well so let me tell you about I guess what I've seen and I've used at least what I've seen be successful. Um I've used foam uh foam pool noodles. So those things you get at the dollar store. You cut off like a one-inch section, and then right. you put a hub. Um, 
I've seen a couple different things. Uh, the one that I love that works really well, unfortunately, is a 3D printed hub. And we'll get into that in a second, but uh, they work great. Um, but, uh, I mean, you can make them out of corks, probably, the hubs. Um, they'd be strong enough and it'd be easy enough to drill. And you could probably glue in uh, some other kind of uh, bearing piece. And we'll talk mm -hmm. about that in a second, too. Um, another thing is I also take a hole saw. If you got like a two-inch hole saw, if you want a two-inch wheel, which a lot of the professionally uh, made wheels are two to three inches. I think that tends to be what our uh, hobby store sells a bunch of. It's good for park flyers and small club flyers, right? Um, okay. And so you basically take a two, two and a half or three inch hole saw that you use on a door. And a lot of people have to do home repairs, typically have one of these. And they're like, why did I buy this stupid thing? I never use it. Um, except for that one door, that one time. Remember that time? Yep, yep. <laughs> you I do still remember. Still have it. Uh, so you can take it. Um, and what I do is I've taken that fatigue matting that you can buy in squares that kind of jigsaw together. And I'll right. just drill, drill a couple, you know, just drill down the line and drill like 10 of those. And I just pop them out as I go. And it's got a hole centered right around the perfect thing. And then you can take it um, with some sandpaper and kind of scuff it up so it's a little bit more um, uh, shaped better because it's a little rough when it starts. Right. But you can take some sandpaper and get it shaped properly. Um, and then you glue those around uh, whatever hub you want to use. Uh, you kind of you can kind of roughly cut out whatever size you need, um, and it's kind of a stiff, dark, uh, resilient foam, kind of rubbery foam, mm -hmm. and it works out really well. Uh, I have seen a friend on our Discord; he does the same thing, but to the pink insulation, and he does like a handful of those, and he'll he'll use different thickness insulation, so the one inch, half inch, or quarter inch, and he'll just go, rrr, 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 and then he'll he'll make a thick uh, tire and it's the pink foam is strong enough where it can take the impact, but you know what I mean? It's uh, it's not terrible, um, but it's lightweight and it's easy to work with. You can sand it and shape it and things like that after the fact, and then you paint it black and it looks like a tire. Okay, um, I think that's I mean, those are the big ones that I've seen, um, and they work out really well. And of course, with the hubs, uh, I've seen uh, people use pop rivets. You know, the pop is a rivet, so the inside of the rivet is the exact same diameter of the wire you're going to use for your landing gear. Um, and then that's a great, strong hub, uh, like a, a bearing wheel almost. Um, okay. And then you basically put your tire around that and fasten it whatever way you can. Uh, I've used 3D printed stuff. I've also used two... Uh, soda bottle caps glued together or taped together like electric tape or whatever. No, I think I've seen you do that before. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had mixed results with that and that uh, the glue doesn't always hold and it's always, it's not always easy to find like the dead center of the, bo the bottle caps because mm -hmm. um, a little bit off kind of starts giving a wobble to the, if you're putting it in and they're, they're perfectly sized to fit inside of that pool noodle that I was talking about. So they're nice. And, and again, the pool noodle is pretty giving as far as if there's a wobble in the roll. Right. Eh, it won't be a big deal. Um, but if you're a perfectionist, that's going to get on your nerves. Uh, and then the other thing is I've also seen the bottom of a Coke can, like an aluminum Coke can. Um, you put those together facing, uh, what is it, out. So they, the, the, the concave is actually... Wait, the convexness of it is actually concave and you put two of them together and you glue it. And then there's a little lip and you basically use a really large O-ring around it or you, you get a strip of, of foam and you glue it right. in place and you kind of shape it. And then that, those are great for like the World War I planes where they had that really big hub and they have, it was almost like they were using bicycle tires. You know, okay. so it kind of gives you that same feel. And of course, it's a lightweight and you can find the center and drill two holes and the aluminum is strong enough to kind of sit right on the axle. OK, now when you're talking about the, the direction of the concave or the convex, are you having the round out or are you yes. having it round in so that it round round out? 
Although I so suppose you could do round in too. I've seen it both ways, but I think uh, round out is the best way to make sure it rolls straight. Because if those two holes are lined up, it's going to roll properly. Um, and then the tire is thin at the inside. Okay. And then it gives that bicycle feel. Again, that's perfect for your World War II, uh, World, World War I biplanes. Um, cause they typically had that kind of landing gear. So they, they look great. I mean, really, it's pretty awesome. Uh, and I think, uh, let's see, prop savers, tires, wheel hubs. Oh, and hull reinforcement. So on, uh, the flight test style things to keep things where they're supposed to be, but yet easily remove them later. Um, we use barbecue skewers to kind of stick through a bunch of pieces and hold them in place. Uh, mm -hmm. Kind of like a cotter pin. Um, and because of that, uh, we have a handful of small holes that we definitely want to keep where they're at. Um, but foam isn't really, the foam board isn't that strong. So what ends up happening is your holes get elongated and there becomes a little bit more slop and too much slop. And now your motor's pulled off the front end and now it's flopping around and well, you know, pretty much so good. Or if you, have and, a, if you have a nose first landing and it shoves the power pod you know, quarter inch <laughs> backwards. Which is like, oh, it's still good. But, you know, now you have a hard time getting your CG to stay right while you're in the air. Right, right, because you have a like a quarter inch slop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, oh, no. Uh, hot glue's not going to fix that. Uh, so <laughs> so one of the ways to, to fix that is you put like a, a reinforcement around that. So I know Flight Test has suggested you basically put a little bit of hot glue in the hole when you first make it. And then you you kind of put in the the barbecue skewer and rotate it around. And that basically pushes the hot glue while it's hot into the foam, kind of creating a more resilient edge. It also keeps your barbecue skewer in place better. Um, however, I found that that doesn't always work well. I end up destroying the hole when I'm if I wait too long and the barbecue skewer is now actually glued in place mm -hmm. a little bit. You guys know, like, oh no, what I do? Um, so one of the other ways is to basically create a washer. Uh, you could do it again with the gift cards. So you take a hole punch and you hole punch and then you cut whatever shape you want. Um, and then you center that over the hole. And then that'll at least be some reinforcement. So if it does go astray, it's not going to bust through the foam. It'll it'll stay in place. Uh, mm -hmm. It'll transfer. Basically what you're trying to do is transfer that impact load for the power pod if it lands. Uh, to the surrounding foam with enough of it so that it won't actually tear the foam up. Um, it won't become a point load. It'll it'll distribute it out. Um, another thing that we did, um, and it took, geez, what was, what was that, like 30 minutes for 20 or 30 of them or something? It was like 10 minutes for 20 of them or something. It was, uh, a, it was a 3D printed washer. It, it Super thin. It was probably about four layers total. And the, the ring was... About the size of a penny, maybe. Mm -hmm. And that's all it was. And you just, it could, because it was a plastic, it was fastened really well with the foam, uh, or sorry, with the hot glue to the, to the foam board. So it did a great job, I thought. Uh, so far as I've seen, it handles up, it holds up pretty well to impact loads and things like that. Yeah, I haven't, uh, the only plane I had it on, I had it on the, I think I had it on the uh, Vulture. And I think and I put a couple. Spitfire. I think I put a couple on the Spitfire. They are in intact and in place. Yes, I I did enjoy them, and then you ran me off a, a couple runs, so I've got a handful in my Good. build box, and I'll I'll be using those. Yeah. <laughs> it was a, a little toasty on the fingers getting glued on, but other than that, um, yeah, they're nice, convenient. It's not like for me, I don't do the bread the bread ties little plastic squares so i don't have a lot of those laying around um i don't get i don't handle a lot of gift cards or have access to a bunch of them right um and so i also personally don't have access to a 3d printer except through you um so that's that may not be a an option for everybody mm -hmm. but yeah uh it was a nice design and i've i've been enjoying them Mm -hmm. Uh, well, just like I don't have really a ton of access to balsa and uh, some people are like, Oh, it's just balsa. It's easy. And I'm like, well, I don't have a ton of it. Uh, I've mm -hmm. also heard, um, the unused hubs from your propellers 
yes. can kind of put them in and glue them in place. Uh, get the really big ones. Um, yes, you're not going to use them for your propeller, that's for sure. Um, and you can just, even if they're a little loose, they're still going to be help. Um, mm -hmm. Another option you can use is actually put a washer in there. You know, buy a bunch of really thin, small washers. Or you can glue them in place. Uh, or you could also build them out of balsa. So you basically, you get a bunch of, I guess, thin ball supply and cut a bunch of circles uh, in the center. You drill the hole the size of your barbecue skewer or whatever it is you're fastening things through with. And then you, you basically embed that into the foam and glue it in place. And that way it kind of spreads the load to a much larger area. Um, yeah, that pretty much, uh, that pretty much sets it all up. All right, Joe, I think that brings us to our last thing that we're going to talk about in this episode, and that's going to be hinges. Um, and I think we're going to talk about things that are for hinges in both foam and balsa. Um, I'm going, to, I've only had experience in foam, so I'm going to use the things that worked for me in foam, but know that some of these uh, are also used in balsa. And typically what you'll do is you kind of uh, either use it the same way we're using it with foam, or instead of kind of cutting out or scooping out pieces of foam, you're you know drilling out pieces of the wood and balsa. It's typically... Okay. Okay. Um, but I know you've, so far you've done some builds and I know you've built some hinges. So tell me, tell me and our listeners um, what you've used so far. Well, I have done the sort of the simple 50% uh, score, you know, where you, you're cutting your control surface out. Mm -hmm. um, and then you pop that control surface back and then you either take your uh, exacto knife or your your hobby knife or you do it with sandpaper but you're you're basically giving yourself a 45 degree angle from that hinge point uh mm -hmm. into your control surface and that that gives it room for that that control surface to move and we'll just say an aileron here um you know by popping it cracking it back folding it back and then cutting that 45 or sanding that 45 out you can then pull it down and you can get that past level so you can pull it on down uh deflection um yep. some of the trouble i ran into with that is nothing big i've gotten better at it as i've done more of them is just making sure that you cut a like close enough to the to the hinge point that you get all the foam out of the way um earlier builds i was leaving little bits i wasn't i was scared to end up cutting the paper so i was mm -hmm. kind of doing my 45 with my knife and then having to go back with sandpaper or my sanding block mm -hmm. and get the rest of it out so that it wasn't binding but with that uh so that that's sort of like the simplest which only has the paper holding your control surface on right um, so the paper ends up being your hinge right and that works uh, the problem becomes sort of the longevity of that hinge uh, mm -hmm. is not going to hold up for very long. Um, now, right, the, I've not... The paper is glued well onto the foam, but only so well. Right. And I've not, not, I've not done just that. That's sort of like the first step in the others that I've done. So I don't know how long that'll, that'll uh, hold out, but basically from the get-go... Um, it was, you know, use some hot glue to reinforce it. And I'll talk about that in a second. So that with repeated use, uh, and if you got a, a plane that you're flying, uh, multiple times that you want to last, you want those, uh, those hinges to continue to hang in there, then you gotta do some reinforcement on it. Um, so the, my go-to, uh, and I imagine probably your go-to as well is to, Pull that control surface back so that you've got, now that you've made that 45, you then pull that control surface or you hinge it back so that 45 is then level with the uncut, unshaved foam edge of the rest of the, the piece of foam. And you're going to lay a bead of hot glue along that hinge. And then you'll take another piece of uh, foam and sort of smear and scrape 
the glue, so you're smearing that hot glue across the foam surfaces and kind of getting it into that foam, melting that foam a little bit due to the heat of the glue, but then you're also scraping it out as you go. <clears throat> so you're leaving a, a very thin amount of hot glue just all in that hinge. Right. And at that point, your strength and longevity is coming from the hot glue, not your paper. Um. Right. Or, now, or what I, most importantly, not not the adhesive between the paper and the foam, right? And that's um, essentially being that's going to be your weak link if there isn't something to reinforce it. So mm -hmm. the hot glue reinforces that bond between the paper and foam, and adds another path for that load from your control surface or from your linkages to to pass through to the rest mm -hmm. of the control surface. So it, it allows that force that's kind of concentrated the control arm to be throughout more of the uh, of the surface. Right. So it works out and, good. Yeah. And I would argue that the paper being on the other side is still uh, necessary because it's the glue on the other side of the paper. It's the, the glue and the paper on opposite sides of a hinge, if you will, working together. Um, yeah. to not let that hinge come apart. Now, um, another one that I've done is to take some thicker uh, clear tape or packing tape and place that along the hinge as a reinforcement. Mm -hmm. um, that seems to reinforce the paper um, and give it a little more strength. But again, um, I worry that just with regular foam, putting that, that tape on there, you're still going to run into the issue of the adhesive from the paper and the foam coming loose. Now, uh, the the tape will give it some reinforcement, but I would still follow that up with glue inside the hinge for reinforcement from the other side. Um, now, I've only, I've not done them combined. I know the Vulture, I did the tape per, per its build video on the outside. Um, but I've generally done the hot glue. Um, the, the downside to reinforcing your hinge, either with tape or with glue, and it's not a huge downside, but I've noticed that once you reinforce it with the glue or the tape, you there's additional resistance uh, for that control surface to want to move and deflect. Uh, it's not much. I can't imagine it's that big of a deal with our servos because we're using the 9 grams, so they've got enough strength. Um, but it is something on the, fir on the first build or two that I did when I felt the difference in tension between there being no reinforcement and having the glue and tape in there that there, there's a little extra oomph needed to, to get that surface to move. That said... Our servos will move it, no problem. I'm not worried about stripping out of yeah. gear. It was just, you know, the first couple times I did, I was like, man, that, right. that adds a good bit of resistance. You want the servo to transfer as much of its capacity to moving the control surface as possible. And every time you make an impediment to that, which is maybe the resistance you see in the glue or the tape, um, or maybe you have a binding somewhere, Maybe mm -hmm. because your cuts to there's not a gap that's actually rubbing up against another piece on the plane, and that's resisting that rotation. Like all of those things reduce the your servo doing its work. Right. And of course, and you I want think... as much of the servo available as possible in case you hit like a gust of wind or something. You you don't want the thing to fail. Right. And I think, because, you know, talking about binding and all that, I think I've had a control surface before where I didn't get my line perfectly straight or there was maybe mm -hmm. I held the knife at a bad angle halfway through. Um, but I think I ended up getting where that, that line had a bit of a curve to it. And so even after I bent the hinge back and did the cut, there was a bit of a, uh, there was a point where the hinge got like it got to it was good but then trying to move past that in either direction there was a bit of tension and it was i think yeah. where basically i had a bit of a curve in that line it was trying to overcome the curve in there so yeah maybe that's um, a point to to mention about hinges um the point at about at which it rotates needs to be straight 
it's worth pulling out the ruler and making sure it's straight every time because mm -hmm. that any curve or bowing in that line will cause uh will basically cause it not to deflect consistently and freely that makes sense um mm -hmm. again this and I always use my straight edge when I'm making these cuts. I never freehand it. But I think the issue get, became... Go ahead. Guess who freehands? <laughs> this idiot. <laughs> well, I always pull my straight edge out. But I think the issue became... I noticed that even when I'm using my straight edge, I end up holding my knife at an angle, you know, side mm -hmm. to side. So yeah. I'm always kind of... I'm not straight up and down. Even though I know you want to have your knife at an angle so you're like bringing the knife long ways or you've you're making yeah you've got your knife at an angle into it so it's cutting and slicing as opposed to like dragging through the foam um yeah. i ended up having it tilted one way or the other to the side and that was just yeah. getting used to you know pulling the pulling the blade through the foam but i'm a little better now so i'm not doing that quite so much and i mm -hmm. didn't notice the the binding due to a curved cut with the spitfire which okay. was you know from scratch so but those are those are the couple i've done what else have you got mm -hmm. um I, I wanted to add that there are professionally produced hinges right there there are a couple products we talked about tape but there is officially a uh, hinge tape and that's essentially uh double or bi-directionally fiber reinforced, very thin fibers and very thin tape with a very strong adhesive. Um, it's a Dubro 916 electric flyer hinge tape. Um, it's basically like a, almost like a woven fabric um, okay. with an adhesive on the back. You, uh, I've actually seen people use um, uh, like Johnson and Johnson's um, medical tape, like medical tape. Um, or something similar to that. And, and then they said they like it because it also paints well. Um, and hmm. it kind of takes on the paint about as well as the, the paper. So you end up really having a very consistent sheen across the plane, which I thought was interesting. But they nice. said they, they like it because it's thin, it's flexible, um, it's a strong adhesive, so it works really well. Um, and that way they can actually just cut off the control surface do the prep on that like you do with, with the, the glue edging and then mm -hmm. put, put them, butt them together so there won't be any binding in the movement, but be able to place the tape so they're tight. Um, and the other thing is actually nylon hinges. They have a small metal pin and they have two, two pieces that, that finger together like you would have on a door. <clears throat> and you basically, and there's a couple, there's a bunch of different styles. You look them up um, uh, but you'll see that basically they're like a door hinge and you mount them inside the control surface and inside the, the piece of the wing that they're mounting to. And they usually mount in the center. Uh, sometimes you can mount them on the outside. You can mount them on the bottom. There's a, again, million different ways to do that, depending on what you're building and how much space you have and what adhesive you want to use. A nylon tends to be a very durable product. It's lightweight. People like to use it. Um, it also, I think, takes molding pretty well. So it's one of the reasons why I think it's uh, used um, in very fine detail applications for plastics. Um, okay. Anyway, so so those are two professional options. And I say professional in the sense that you go to a store, you get your hobby store will have these. Um, you go to a, a website that sells these things um, for RC stuff and you, you'll find them. Um, uh, one of the things I've heard about, and I, I actually have used once or twice, and it, it worked, it's still working really well, is a pinched zip tie. So basically, you take a zip tie of whatever thickness you want, I guess, and that, you know that's relatively flexible. It's got the teeth in it, and so it's got a a, a texture to it, so that mm -hmm. when you uh, you basically poke a hole with uh, an appropriately sized something, maybe cut out a hole with your X-Acto knife or maybe use a barbecue skewer or a small piece of wire to kind of cut out the size of your zip tie and kind of hollow out a little space on both sides of your control. Um, and then where you want the hinge, 
you take a plier and you almost cut all the way through it. So you pinch it. And so at that point where you want the hinge, it's very thin. But okay. nylon's very strong. You know, zip ties are incredibly strong. And it's more than enough to keep the control surface in place and yet flexible. Um, you will see a resistance in either direction, but it'll still be um, plenty flexible to, you know, for your server to do the work it's got to do and keep your plane going the way you want. It's also very strong, so it's not like your surface will tear off. And it takes glue well. Um, hot glue, specifically. Uh, and I've used it. And then so far, it's actually held up really well. I'm planning, uh, after that crash with the uh, the nose-in crash that I was trying to do, the high-speed run that didn't quite, you know, pull out of the dive. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I have a whole control surface along one of the wings or two of the wings where the whole the foam came off um it's still intact and actually i could probably glue it back into place but um i, I figured i was going to glue it back into place with those types of hinges i did the same thing in the tail the tail held up the actual control surface and the tail itself held up well the tail wasn't attached to the plane itself well enough that's what came apart in the crash um okay. actually before the crash uh which is what what the problem was um <laughs> so i'm going to use that same uh hinging method for the rest of the plane uh when i put it back to get finished putting it back together um so that one worked really well i was kind of surprised i i was like i don't know this is going to be really hard and i realized like after putting it in i was like no well, this moves pretty freely yeah, there's a little bit of resistance but it's not much um and in most of the areas it's going to count you want to it's barely noticeable so uh there's that Let's see. And then I've tried a couple, I'll call it hybrid methods. Um, let's see. Uh, you have, we talked about the one tape hinge. Um, and the, the one tape hinge is, we have the tape on the top and then you fold it back and you put the tape along the bottom where it meets up to the top surface tape and then it continues over along the control surface that you're trying to adhere to the main body and so that way the two tape pieces touch together just a little bit and then and then that way it's it it allows for a freer movement so you will have less resistance because i was running into the same problem was that you know i'd put on the top and then i'd roll a piece of tape along the bottom and then I found like it's actually pretty stiff. And mm -hmm. I think the thing is, is you have to leave a very small, a little bit bigger gap than you would normally. So when you do the top tape, leave a small gap, um, probably a 32nd of an inch maybe. Okay. And then when you fold it back, you bring the tape along it. And then that's like that little gap is enough for the two tapes to touch. And, it and of course, there's going to be strong adhesion. And if it's a thin tape, that'll that'll leave for a very flexible joint, and yet strong. Okay. And for clarification, you're talking about a say a detached control surface. This isn't like you're yes. taping both sides where the papers already exist. So you've already cut this control surface out. Yes. And, then and it has the V, like you were talking about. Okay. The bevel. And all that stuff. And you're basically deflecting it almost 135 degrees from normal. Okay. And then so that way the plane and the bevel are in line. And then you roll the tape up along that. And then because you have that small gap in the tape on the top surface, the, the two as you roll it up, the, the two tapes are going to touch in just that, that, that 30 second inch gap. Right, and then you kind of roll it back, and then and then you have a lot more freedom of movement. Because I was I was I made a comment to Andrew Newton, who does a bunch of slope soaring, and he was talking about how he's going to make a day pinch. Oh, it's no big deal. I love these things; they're super strong, they're great. And I'm like, well, I always have a problem with like the movement is always restricted at that point. Once I do the tape on the other side, I I don't I can feel it resisting, and he's like, oh no, you're doing it wrong. Here's what you got to do. <laughs> and okay. it kind of indicated like, oh, you need a little bit of a gap and, you know, you pull it back a little bit further than you think, and then you do it and then you put it back like, oh, oh, okay, thanks. 
Um, so uh, uh, I'm going to continue to give that a try because since I've, I'll call it out an advice on that. Um, uh, I think I've tried it once and it turned out well, but uh, uh, anyway, I haven't given it a, a really like honest effort where I sat down and like, okay, let me let me check one versus the other versus the other. Uh, I, I like to do that when I when I can to see the differences between them. Um, right. The next is I'll call it a woven tape hinge, and that's basically where you take two small pieces of tape, whatever width you got, and you overlap sticky sides together. The the thickness of the material you're joining of the control surfaces. So in our case, if we're using Dollar Tree foam board, it's three sixteenth inch thick. So the overlap between the sticky sides that are going to face each other and touch, and and when we get it, the hinge together, it's going to be three sixteenth inch. Okay, and that's the stuff that you're going to stick. So one of the tape surfaces is going to go along the bottom of the main body of the plane. It's going to roll up. And remember, both of the sticky sides are touching each other. So the front side and the back side are not sticky at this point as you roll it up in between the main body and the control surface. You butt the control surface against it and you roll, which now is instead of the sticky side up, you've flipped it over right in the middle of the okay. hinge. And now it's facing down and you push push the control surface tight against it and you put the put the tape sticky side that's now sticky side down on the control surface. So once the sticky side's down on the control surface, um, you then do the same thing, but opposite. So those fingers are now the one going to the con the main body is tape side sticky side down. You put that in, and you butt it up. And you have it butt up against the original piece, sticky side down. Tape it. Bring it. It's now through the hinge. Right. And then your sticky side on the control surface is now up and you roll that along the bottom and you basically do that two more times and you just make sure that the control surface is tight against the main body. And when you don't do, when you're done, you have a, almost like a Jacob's ladder um, where the string is on the top on one side and on the bottom of the other. And as you flip it, the outside edge uh, the edge that's going to be facing the the wind is going to be tight against the foam board. Right. So it's always tight no matter which way it's deflecting. The, the point it's deflecting towards is tight. And because you're stacking them side by side, the tightness of one side is going to keep it from trying to pull loose the other side. Uh, exactly. And so what you end up having is a foam board that's butt up against each other or the the, the surface and the main piece that are tight against each other yet can deflect freely in either direction okay which is pretty cool um but it's really important that you keep things tight as you do it so it's one of those things you try out a couple times and get good at i've had a couple of them where they were a little bit loose so what you end up having is the control surface can actually move away from the main body which uh, allows for a lot more slop than you want so yeah. it's a good hinge. It's actually awesome, but you have to do it right and have to be careful with it. Um, but it's worth trying. Uh, I think we have two more that I'm ready to talk about. One is the paper hinge. And that is literally, you take strips of paper and you, so you have a barbecue skewer, that's your hinge. And you roll a piece of paper alternating that goes from the control surface around the barbecue skewer and back to the control surface. And then you do the main body around the barbecue skewer and back to the main body and you glue them to the main body. And you keep doing that alternatingly down the control hinge. And then you just glue that last one in place with the barbecue skewer so the barbecue skewer doesn't slide out. Okay, and that one, based on the way you're explaining, is not unlike a door hinge just right. all along the length of it. And your barbecue skewer is that metal pin that goes through. Uh, Essentially. Why, why would you want to use a hinge like that? Because there's like other options that are just easier. 
I, you know, it was something I thought of and I want to try out and it turned out it worked out great. Uh, so one of the things I like about it is that the barbecue skewer as the pin keeps the surface strong. Um, especially if it like hits against something, you're not going to have a deflection of your, um, your rudder isn't going to okay. be, it's going to give some stiffness to the rudder. It's not going to bend as easy. I know I'm always terrified that I'm going to bump my rudder against something by accident because mm -hmm. in the traditional build methods for the Dollar Tree foam board, there's, there's nothing stiffening your rudder like at all. So all it takes is a good whack and you're in trouble. So this helps stiffen it up as well as make sure that the hinge is, isn't wavy. Okay. So it's an, a little, even if you made your cut a little off, as long as that pin is in there and the paper is tight in both directions, you know, and even then it, it there's a little bit of room for play. You don't want it so tight that it, it can't move at all. Um, the thing I'm concerned about is that over the long haul, that paper might wear and you might have slop up and down, but you're not going to have it in and out. Now, are you uh, using like printer paper cut in the strips or is there any special paper you're using? Or just the paper you pulled off of the foam board. Okay. I mean, really, just uh, spare spare stuff you have, just pull it out and I glued it on. I don't know. I just, I, whatever random stuff was working. I think you could use tape, uh, should work as well. Um, I think I didn't use tape because I know if you get a tear in the tape, uh, it, sometimes the run just goes all the way to the other end and now you've lost right. all, all usage there. So anyway, so that, I think that's why I want paper because paper will fray, and show signs of wear before it actually becomes a genuine issue. It'll probably end up binding before it actually becomes loose. Whereas I thought I was worried that with the tape it it might um it might bind or it it might come loose first. And that's the last thing you want while you're flying. I'd rather have it bind up and make it harder for the servo to work and work sort of maybe sluggish. That's right. a lot better than having it not work at all. So um I think the last one, and I'm, I don't know what to call this, uh, it's kind of a sister to this, and that you have an, a skewer or a pin, but that you embed into the control surface. I, I use this on my Bird of Time, and what it, it, the Bird of Time has, the tail is a double thickness foam. So the double thickness of two sheets of foam board is three-eighths of an inch. That's also the perfect size for a craft stick. Craft sticks are three eighths of an inch in width. So what I did is I drilled in the round part. I drilled, uh, I think I drilled a hole that's the size of the landscaping wire. And I drilled it. I put the three three sticks on top of themselves and I drilled a hole straight through. And then I, I positioned those three and I poked them through the front edge of my, I'll call it, it's like a butterfly control surface that I fold in half. And so those fingers push through at three different points and that hinge pin is actually at the very front edge of the control surface, which is the halfway, the mirror point that's beveled. Okay. And then I, I roll the control surface together and I've got a double thickness control surface with a pin in the front. So it keeps it rigid. Um, it's just important that it's up near the front. Um, and then of course I have a taper. And so when I'm done, I have a perfect control surface with three fingers coming out. And those three fingers get sandwiched in grooves. And so you basically, you mark out where the grooves are, put the control surface against it, and you glue the three pins in the one side and close up the other side of the tail on those three pins. And now the pins are glued in firmly. The tail is on those hinge points, which can move freely. Um, and now all you have to do is attach your con control horn and control rods and away you go. And it's incredibly strong and very stiff. And I was worried about it because the bird of time is a 10 foot wingspan bird and the tail isn't insignificant and it does a lot of work because it is a two channel, a three channel craft. Right. Only because it has a motor. So the rudder does a lot of work and I wanted to make sure it wasn't going to, be loose. It wasn't going to come off. 
it wasn't going to that it'd be stiff and uh, it turned out so far so good now you've got pictures for a lot of these in the show notes that we're looking at are you going to mm -hmm say upload those to our Google Drive and I can link those in the show notes below because some of these I kind of needed to see pictures alongside as we were talking about to make sure I understood exactly what you were talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, look in the show notes for a link. Uh, I will take out our hinge section here and I'll make a PDF of what we have because there's a number of links to products and some build blog pages um, that kind of go into a little bit more detail on how to do it. So uh, if you're interested in any of these methods, go check it out, and that should have a lot a, a lot of information and or a, enough information for you to give it a try yourself and see what you like. Um, I would love to hear any more hinge ideas, but what I found is hinges are varied. I mean, they all do the same thing, but there's about a dozen ways to do it, and all of them work very differently. And in some ways, they're almost better in some applications than others. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of it has to do with the base material that you're working with. Um, it's it's just neat. Um, I'm curious to see what other kind of hinges are out there. So if you're listening and you have an idea that we didn't cover, uh, reach out to us. Let us know. Okay. Well, uh, with the main topic out of the way, uh, let's talk about the workbenches for a minute. I'll go ahead and say... Uh, that I might be able to get some building done uh, before Halloween, in which case, uh, in honor of Halloween, if I do any building, uh, I may try to revive the old fogey, but take the the main wing and sort of do a bit of a bat wing cut and see if see if that would get off the ground. <laughs> nice, that'd, look, <laughs> that'd be a lot of fun. Uh, so I see reviving old projects from the grave. <laughs> Yeah, well, I wasn't trying to take a page out of your book, but you know, you've been uh, wanting me to redo the fogey. But what's going to be on your bench coming up? Uh, it's honestly, I was going to do the same thing. I was going to revive some old projects. Um, I was actually, I've been looking at the bird of time, getting that uh, what I was looking to fix up with that fixed up, so I could fly it. Um, and I've got a special couple Halloween builds that I've been working on in honor of this build challenge that I threw together on a whim. Um, and I'm excited to see what some other people come up with too, but I'm going to be working on some of those projects as well. So uh, that, that'll keep me busy, I think. Okay. Um, well then, as we're working on closing this out, guys, if uh, you have any unusual build materials that, uh, that you guys use and I say unusual build materials because that was sort of an idea uh, for the episode name that I pitched around with Matthew but uh, sort of what we had was the uh, the bread ties, uh, the square bread ties and then the, the uh, Dollar Tree floss hooks um, and then some of the things we talked about tonight but if you've got any uh, unusual materials that you utilize feel free to let us know um, it, we do have a community page of the Facebook pay, uh, a community section of the Facebook page. So feel free to go in there and, and share what you use and what you do. Um, yeah. Now, now that I'm aware of it, I'll be keeping an eye on that as well. <laughs> yeah, me too. Do we know what we're going to be talking about next episode yet? Uh, yeah, we do. Um, I, I think we realize I realized uh, our next release date is on Halloween itself. Oh boy. So I was thinking that if our listeners could help us out with some of the scariest stories that they've seen in RC, uh, I'd, I'd love to hear them. Um, I know we're going to be talking about some of our scariest experiences that we've had, maybe near misses or close calls or things we've heard about or seen. We might have a ghost story or two. I mean, who knows? Um, or any uh, old projects that you're reviving from the grave like we are. Um, so if you want, uh, reach out to us, let us know what you're doing uh, and any stories that you might have that we uh, we could share with everybody. Um, I think of it almost like a, I like to think of it, it's a, it's a spooky, scary uh, service announcement, you know, uh, in a way. It's like our way of saying, hey, you know, hobby is a lot of fun. Uh, don't forget, it can, it can be dangerous. So keep your mind on the task you're doing and don't, don't let yourself get complacent. Um, 
uh, with with using things that you're so used to using, for example, X-Acto knife, right? We use it in everything we do. It's easy to forget that they're really sharp. Mm -hmm. I could do some damage. All right. Well, um, yeah, so feel free to reach out to us on Facebook page or email us aviationrcnew at gmail.com. Um, let us know what you got going on. Matthew, is there anything else for tonight? Uh, yeah, there's uh, one last thing. I just wanted to remind everybody that November 14th, 2020, between 7 and 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in our Discord server, we'll have a link, um, is our Hangar RC build night. So go over to the hangarrc.com for, um, uh, to pick out an item of theirs or maybe download a PDF plan for free. Um, you can, if you buy anything on their website, you can use ARCN-BN1, all lowercase, for a 10% off anything you, you buy from the store. Um, and, you know, just say hello to Sam Platt for us. All right. Well, guys, it's been enjoyable, and we will see y'all next time. All right. See you then. A spooky time. Ha, 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 ha.